Hello, what's up guys? It is Deltray, we are back with some more Final Fantasy Tactics 1.3. Last time we defeated Bailey, was one of the most difficult... Well, I guess maybe not most difficult, but one of the most infamous bosses in the entire game, for sure. I can only imagine how many people had their runs of this game ended by that guy back as a kid. Lord knows, he was certainly hell for me. Don't even get me started on 1.3 version, oh my god. That one took me quite a while to get down, but fortunately I've lost to him enough times that I don't feel that. We did too bad on the previous part. Now today we got a battle that's all luck, man. It's all luck. Anything could happen. Anything could happen, but hopefully we'll be able to pull through. Now before I actually explain how we're gonna try this, somebody did actually ask if I could do another recap on the story. Now I don't wanna do anything before act three again because I already did that at the start of act three. So if you're curious about the story up until that point, maybe go back and check out like part 11, part 12. I'm something around there but yeah sure I can definitely recap everything that's happening in act 3 so far it doesn't seem like a problem to me it starts out pretty simple right so my G right now is sort of aware of the fact that this overreaching war that's been going on sort of in the background as far as this part right but he's aware that this war is somehow being manipulated by a higher power because we firsthand dealt with several Lukavi at this point it's pretty apparent to us that they're sort of the ones influencing this war. They're the ones sort of influencing this conflict. So the first thing my G did was of course try to reason with his brothers who are on the side of Prince Larg in all of this. We've also seen Delita who's been working in collusion with uh, with Goltana, right? So we have my G over here, his brothers working with Larg, and then we have Delita working with Goltana. My G is sort of a rogue in all this, sort of a free agent. He just wants the war to end. Of course, we weren't able to convince Dice and Dark to lay down his arms at all. And we've also sort of learned that my G has a target painted right on his back, right? The church is out to get him at this point because of the death of Cardinal Draclau. Now, of course, we know that he was influenced by the power of the Holy Stone, has already sold his soul to the Lukavi. And the only reason we ended up killing him was basically self-defense, more or less, because he did attack us first, technically. However, that's not the story that's being spread around, right? We ran into Zalmo, that heresy examiner. And although he is out to get my G, something tells me that Zalmo, honest to God, believes that we have murdered the Cardinal in cold blood. And that's a pretty big deal because Cardinal Draclaw was a very respected figure in the Land of Evil East. So for him to just suddenly die like that, well, there's gonna need to be an explanation, quite frankly. It doesn't sound too good to say that he was actually a giant monster all along, right? So there had to be some kind of scapegoat. Now, whether the church knew or not the truth of the situation, it's not really clear. But they did need it out, and that out is named My G. Speaking of My G, though, he is none too naive at this point. He's definitely coming out of that whole, uh, that whole character flaw, I would almost call it. And he's trying to take a little bit more initiative in this act, so that's why we convinced Alma to take us to the Orban Monastery to see if we couldn't uh, gain the upper hand in this behind-the-scenes conflict, right? So we, it's kind of two conflicts, right? We've got the main one between Prince Larg and Prince... Not Prince Goltana, but Prince Larg and Goltana both fighting for the same power, right? They both want to be what is essentially king, ruler of all evilies. And then we have this secondary conflict, although I would almost argue that this is the main conflict, we have my G versus this other power that we're, we're not entirely sure what that is just yet. But it's a safe bet to assume that the Shrine Knights are very heavily involved with this. So we can almost say it's my G versus the Shrine Knights in the background while Prince Larg and Goltana are duking it out in the public eye. So we go to Orban Monastery in order to try and gain the upper hand. But because my G is branded as a heretic, we had no choice but to bring our sister Almo along with us. Because she has ties to the priesthood, so she's she's able to come and go as she pleases, basically. Whereas we would, of course, be captured and turned in on sight. Ultimately, through our adventures at the Orban Monastery, we were able to recover the Germanic scriptures. Now, this is huge. This is huge, and I did say that I think that the game should have called a bigger attention to this. Because these scriptures essentially out the church as liars. They essentially explain the fact that although the church is in the highest position of power in all of Ivalice, right, that they've essentially been manipulating the people all along into believing in what is essentially a false god, more or less. Now the 
the scriptures themselves are written by a disciple of Saint Ajora, and Ajora being the god that they worship in this world. So having these scriptures that outright say, hey, everything you know is a lie, it's it's a power play for my G, right? If he's got these scriptures, it essentially proves that there's so much more to this whole conflict going on. And it sort of invalidates the whole Larg vs. Goltana thing at this point because there's because there's, there would be bigger fish to fry at that point. So my G has his hands on the one thing that would guaranteed out the church. It would 100% be their downfall if the information within the scriptures were brought to public light. Now presumably Baron Ten, the adopted father of Rafa and Malak, caught wind of the fact that we got our hands on these scriptures at some point. And this part is a little bit less clear. But I think we can kind of put together the pieces and decide on what happened. So we saw Islud leaving the monastery with Alma. At some point it is very likely that some of Baron Ten's men, perhaps perhaps Malak himself, were able to recover Alma from Islud's care. And Essentially, she moved from kidnapper to kidnapper at that point, right? So Barrington has Alma, or had Alma, up until this point in the story. At which point he had perfect leverage to get us to come to Riavana's castle, which is exactly what we have done, in order to hand deliver him the scriptures himself. Because again, whoever has those scriptures is going to be the one with the power to destroy the church. However, if somebody such as Barrington had the scriptures, he's a very well protected man. He's the duke of this entire area, so for him to just suddenly fall over dead would obviously look very bad. They can't just take him out in the same way that they can take out my G. Which is why he's so concerned with getting his hands on these scriptures himself. How should I put it? Whoever has the scriptures basically has the church by the holy stones. You following me? Now all the stuff with Rafa and Malak, specifically, as in like their particular characters, a lot of that stuff is not necessary to the main plot. However, I still think it's a good thing that they exist because it could have just been like generic henchman number 36 or whatever who was making these demands from IG. But by having Rafa and Malak sort of serve as this bridge between the Orban Monastery and Riavana's castle, I think it does good to, uh, to sort of flesh out the world a little bit more. It also goes a long way to make Barrington out to be a gigantic prick, which we'll see in a few moments, no doubt in my mind. But just keep in mind, their story isn't really too central to the plot. Not really. And of course, we've had more run-ins with the Shrine Knights, right? Don't forget, Weegraf is working with those guys. As far as we know, just for the record, in case you're kind of, in case you're kind of lost on who's allied with who, I definitely understand why it would be starting to get pretty confusing right about now. Uh, we had Vormav, Wegraf, and Islud, who are all Shrine Knights. And then we also know that Delita, at one point or another, was working with the Shrine Knights. And the Shrine Knights are essentially Templars, right? They're the hands of the church that go out and execute their less savory orders, basically. Keep in mind, again, even, even between Larg and Goltan's little spat here, the church is the one with the real power in Ivalice. That doesn't mean that Larg and Goltana are fighting over nothing, though. They'd, they would most likely be left more or less to their own devices. And it's sort of like a sort of like a puppet head ruler, if you will. They would have some level of power, but at the end of the day, the church, as is right now, has the final say. They are the most powerful organization in the world. Now, as for why people are trying to gather these holy stones... We know that Barrington wants them, obviously, for selfish reasons. He knows that they have some sort of power. Not 100% just yet, although I assume that Vormav gave him a pretty good demonstration of exactly what it is that they're capable of. So we've got somebody like that who wants to get his hands on these all-powerful stones, and we know that that can be no good. We've also seen the Shrine Knights, two of them now, in fact, turn into these Lukavi. We had Wegraf, and it's heavily implied that Vormav could do the same. All we really know is that these Shrine Knights are bad news and that these Holy Stones are what they're after. And those two things combined could be a very, very huge problem, although we don't know what their ultimate goal is at this point. We're not even really sure if the Church at large is fully aware of what this branch is doing. 
I'm not sure if that's ever explicitly stated or not, to be honest, but... Needless to say, they're up to no good. And we would all be a lot better off if my G were the one to succeed in gathering these stones. As opposed to Vormav and his kind. I mean, the dude murdered his son in cold blood. What do you want me to say? Not too good of a guy, to say the least. Uh, yeah, I think that just about covers everything. So, here's what we got for today. We got my G as the chemist with the chocobo gun. I actually gave him the red shoes just to have a little bit more movement. Because it's going to be very important that we can distract the enemies on this next map from a certain VIP target who is very dumb. <laughs> has no problems at all getting herself killed in like a turn and a half. So we need to be ensuring that we can get closer to the enemy than they are to this certain guest character who is, once again, not the brightest. Certainly not the sharpest tool in the shed. Has no problem getting herself killed at every opportunity. God damn it, Rafa. <laughs> yeah, spoiler alert, it's Rafa again. So we have the, uh, the red shoes on him to give him a little bit extra movement. And he also has the chocobo gun still because it's 100% damage and cannot miss. I'm not sure how much that will matter, but I would assume that the enemies on this next map have a fair bit of evade. So being able to negate that should help us out somehow. We don't actually need the judo outfit or anything like that, so maybe I rework a little bit on his equipment setup, but for now we're going to try this. Then we have Regina. She has the thief hat and the wizard rod. Turns out we actually did have one, and she is a wizard at this point because they are stronger magically than priests. And... We need damage on this next map, straight up. Damage, damage, damage. She has the 108 gems in order to boost holy, but she also has very little HP, which I may have to take advantage of because... Again, we need to pull as many enemies away from Rafa as possible because her, like, her starting position is horrible. It couldn't actually be any worse if she started the battle off dead. It would be the same damn thing. <laughs> so we have Regina with really low HP and really high damage output. I'm not sure which we'll be taking advantage of, but... The option is nice. Also has the Thief Hat because she's not very fast naturally. We actually have Estelle as a Oracle just so she can use the Whale Whisker. She has attack up and some magic boosting crap which will give her some pretty good damage as well. She has decent range on top of that because she has 5 movement naturally and also 2 range from the Whale Whisker so that should be good. Doesn't really matter what her skill set for this next battle is because honestly it's never ever ever going to last more than 2 rounds. There's not a chance in hell. And we also have Yurchil, who's going to be coming along. He's just rocking his standard setup. I don't know. Maybe Precision. Maybe we get, like, a Time Strike or something. Because that would probably help out quite a bit. I could buy a Bandit on him, but we don't need that just yet, I feel. I'm not trying to do anything with Evasion here. We just got to we just gotta get our kills, man. We just got to get our kills, man. And this is going to be one of the quickest, dirtiest fights you've ever seen. I promise. Because the goal is actually pretty simple. We need to drop one enemy into critical. That's all we need to do. Just one enemy. Just one. And it sounds so easy. It sounds so easy. But I promise you that everybody who has played this game blind will tell you that this fight is a bastard. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. If you were playing this blind and you didn't have some crazy DPS by this point, like a two-fisting monk or whatever, or like a, like a two-fisting ninja, oh, man, this fight is brutal. Oh man, this fight is brutal if you can't do it quick, even in the vanilla game. And this is 1.3, so it's only 10 times worse, naturally. Oh uh, man, this scene still unsettles me to this very day. I, I really, ooh, Barrington is just such a creep, dude. Kind of makes this voice inappropriate, but it's also really disgusting, so it, it kind of is appropriate, but, well, you'll see. This is what I get, revenge for my kindness. Why do you still think you're alive, even today? Because of me! I took you out of your garage. Or did you forget that already? I took you out of your garage? No, I took you out of the garbage. Revenge for kindness. You burned the village. You're the one who killed my parents. And you say it's revenge for kindness. No, it's justice. Tell him, Rafa. I actually don't dislike Rafa as a character. I just... Uh, she's not a very good, like, unit, I guess. For lack of a better word. Brocklet. How can you kill me? I'm your father, but I raise you. I would like to see you try and kill me. Come on, Rafa. <laughs> you can, and you know why? Because your body recalls the terror. Don't worry, that terror will gradually subside. <laughs> Is that true? 
Ugh. It just makes me feel dirty just saying it, man. So the implication there is that Barrington more likely than not abused Rafa. Like, not only did he kill her parents and Malak's as well, but but he was very likely to be abusive to her. Which is just, like, all kinds of messed up, man. It's really, really dark. And, it, I mean, it's it's all but confirmed, because you see that she's, she's, like, hesitating. She's hesitating, and why would she do that if that wasn't the case? And considering he's... Like, he thinks he has the upper hand, so why would he be lying? So it's just, like, it's a really, it's a really bad situation. It's really, really dark, in fact. That kind of makes Malak seem like a gigantic douche. Because he's been taking this guy's side the whole time. It's, it's, it's a really sad situation, honestly. Is what you said true? You're turning on me too. You're both in grace. I'll kill you. Yes, kill him. Stop it, Rafa. And see, like, Malak is just such a... Like, just let him. Or just let her. Just let her go at him. Malak. I assume he only really did that, though, to save Rafa, naturally. Malak, are you alright? Rafa, Malak. No, you're my name. Don't move. Bravo, if you want to help Malak, bring the stone here. Malak should have it. Find it. And Malak does have the holy stone. That's right. Bring it to me. Hurry. And. Yeah. Goodbye. Thanks, Letty. Can you hand me the stone? M Marquis Elmdor, why are you here? I heard you got shot with an arrow. Yeah, I just went to an inn, slept it off. <laughs> Not sure why the game doesn't call attention to the fact that Elmdor is supposed to be dead, though. It, it makes this whole scene seem like it kind of comes out of nowhere, but if you read the bar stuff, it really doesn't. It, it's just kind of surprising, though, because this, this does actually matter, you know what I mean? No, give it to me and my flowing locks. My G, watch out. They're not human. No one has hair that good. So, your heretic, my G. I never really thanked you for doing me this favor. Thank you. I don't want to have to get rough like Vormav did. Please understand. Now hand me over the stone and I'll ask Vormav to return your sister. Where's Alma? Bring her back. Didn't you hear me? Give me the stone first. No. No, I won't. Are you abandoning her? I thought you came here to save her, knowing there'd be danger. Very well. I didn't want to get rough, but... Celia, Liddy, go ahead. That girl has the stone. Get it back. No, don't get it back. Don't get it back. We can just give it to him, man. I'm not trying to do this. Conditions for winning. Protect dumbass. All right. So, you may have noticed that there's only three of them, and there's five of us counting Rafa. However, you will also notice that Rafa starts in this situation. Fortunately, it looks like Elmdor, Man of the Hour here, Arc Knight and all, does not have a whole lot of movement range, so there's always that. He has three movement. The Sword Spear, which it's like a souped up draw out command, so he can use all the sword spells like... Uh, the Katana spells, basically. So he can do all of those. I'm not sure if there's any other hidden commands that he can use because of the Sword Spirit uh, skill, but... Needless to say, draw out is dangerous enough on its own. He also has black robe and went away gems, so I guess all of his skills will be boosted. And a Muramasa with two hands. So what is that? How much damage is that to Rafa if he hits her even a single time? Uh, 15 times 2, so that's 30. 30 times 13 is 390 damage. If Elmdor can attack Rafa at melee, she will die immediately. And keep in mind, she has to survive. So, he's terrifying, yes. With 10 speed as well, yeah, he's a huge problem. Then we have Letty, the assassin. Now, they look like dancers, but no, they're so much worse. They're so much worse. They have this used hand skill set, which just has so many nasty skills. If it's a bad thing that could happen to you in this game, they can probably do it. They have 100% chance for instant death with one of their abilities. I believe it's called Stop Bracelet. And I don't think that Rafa is actually immune to instant death, is she? 
Uh, doesn't look like she is. Maybe it's some hidden property she has, but theoretically they could just kill her. And if that weren't bad enough, they of course have two swords. Which I also think would be enough damage to just kill her. Maybe. Uh, 12 times 9. Ooh, that would be so close. Maybe they have bad with her or something. Virgo and Pisces and Gemini. Okay, so they, they actually do have bad compatibility with her. So I guess they can't instantly gimp her. So that's good. Yeah, bad and worse. Look at that. Good game design. Haha. -ha. But at any rate, they have that use hand ability, right? So that's 100% instant death moves. They have a 100% ranged instant stop move. A 100% ranged instant petrify move it's seal it's the same one you've already seen that but they also have a 100% ranged instant charm move on top of just having absolutely bonkers battle combat stats like look at this not nine physical attack ten magic I don't know if they use their magic but it's more than I'm really willing to deal with to say the least and they're relatively fast nine speed isn't too slow I thought they'd be a lot faster to be honest then they have Celia over here who can somehow dual wield katanas. God damn it, Celia. Also, they both cheat because they use helmet items in their accessory slot, so thanks for that game. But really, it's that use hand ability that just is like, oh man. It doesn't really matter if you can survive them outright because chances are they have some kind of status that they can nail you with. Be it petrify, stop, instant death, even charm. Even charm is not good. And since all of these are 100% rates, the only way to evade it is to be totally immune. So, they're horrifying. Even if you could break their stuff somehow, they both have martial arts, so it's not as though you're really gaining any ground with that. Looks like Celia has MP switch, but we can pop that right now because you're told to get the first move. And I think he should be in range, as he is. Good. So I think we're going to try to dogpile Celia. You only need to drop one of these three into critical health. Anyone will do. Anyone will do. We actually don't get both MP switches. I don't know if that's better or worse. Now, Elmdor is going to blast Rafa for half of her health right here. That's no good. But we we definitely need to get more people over to Celia and Letty immediately so that they will have people to pick on whose name is not Rafa. <laughs> because it's, it's just not a good look. They could so easily drop her, I'm sure. Oh, nice one, Rafa. Actually, yeah. She didn't pop the MP switch, though. There goes damage split. I'm not entirely sure which of the two girls is actually better to try and drop. I can promise you the dropping Elm Door is no move. But of the two girls, I'm not sure which is better because... Ocelia has way more HP. She had over 100 more HP. She didn't have a damage split. And we're about to get rid of her MP switch for good. I'm actually going to move Regina in. I do think that it's in my best interest to give these girls somebody to attack whose name is not Rafa like straight up because Celia can kill Rafa despite the fact that they have really bad compatibility so this seems to make some sense to me my only big fear here is that again we didn't actually pop the MC, the uh, the MP switch so that could come back to haunt me Estelle can take a nice shot at you right now Ooh! oh we did less oh no no, no. we did slightly more oh <laughs> I was I was shook no, 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 that was MP Switch coming through a little bit. Oh, she's down to 216. I think we might actually have this. Oh, what was that? Phoenix down? <laughs> nice one, my G. I was thinking about shooting her, but no, no, no. We, we can just, we can pick up. We can pick up Yurchul. Because he outsped these girls. So we should outspeed them again, yeah? He does. Can I get the time striked in? I can't, but ooh, Elmdor's coming up. Elmdor's coming up. There's no time for a time strike. And he can just backshot Rafa, killing her instantly. Rafa is dead as they come. Unless we end this right here. So I have no choice, I guess, but to hope that we've done enough damage to Celia. Yeah, there's no other alternative. One, two, come on, crit, crit, yes! <laughs> She's in crit. Fight over. Oh, no way. Oh, guys, I just promised that can go so much worse. That can go so much worse. Do I even need to explain why? Did we see the battle I saw? Did we see where Rafa started? Did we see her charge those two assassins? Oh. 
Thank God you only have to drop them into crate. You don't actually have to kill them as we can see. And you only have to do that to any one of them. Any one at all. But like I said, I really don't think dropping Elmdor into crit is really a move because he has a Mito for one. So that's pretty annoying right there. He's also the fastest by far. And if you have to focus fire on Elmdor, it means that you're not really pulling Celia and Letty away from Rafa so much. Because they, like, they would have to... It's kind of hard to describe, I suppose. But if your entire team is heading the same direction as my G, then she's fairly exposed. She would be the one on the front line, if that makes sense. So I think that that's pretty risky. I usually like to try and kill one of the assassins. Oh, that went way too well. That went way too well, guys. I assure you that can go so much worse. It really can. It can just go so much worse. But that is why I wanted to have my characters have sort of low HP on this fight. Because I do think that that somehow impacts who the enemy will attack. Like, if they can... If they can kill two characters, they'll usually go for whoever has the least HP, I do believe. Unless there's, like, some other factor, like, for example, if you're charging a spell that would do a lot of damage to one of the enemies, they will kill the character charging the spell in order to save on the damage, but they will, when all other things are equal, attack whoever has the least HP, I do believe. Something to keep in mind. And since Rafa actually had a fairly respectable 200 and something-ish, it's not too hard to undercut that by a little bit at least. Not like it matters, everything on this, like every opponent on this map can kill you with some skill. So, <laughs> pick your poison, really. I see why Quecklin and Vilius were beaten. Celia, Letty, retreat. Listen well, my G. If you want our stone, come to Limpery Castle. We'll be waiting. And wait he shall. Probably gonna have to wait for me to go do some poaching though, because it is about that time. It is about that time. I can't believe how well that went. <laughs> yes! Malak. Oh, right. Malak is still dead. But did you see that battle? Oh man, they ran like a bitch! 9,400? Cool. Not really a whole lot of money at this point, I'll be honest. Although we have all these propositions coming up, so it shouldn't matter too much. Because we are about to go into Act 4, my friends. And don't worry, that doesn't mean we're almost done. Oh, God forbid, right? Act 4 is easily the longest part of the game. Like, for any one solitary act, anyways. It's probably about the length of two acts. I'm surprised they didn't cut it in half, to be honest. Maybe they just had time constraints or something. Brother, look, it's dawn. Blech. Remember how we used to chat till dawn about things? This bullet really hurts. I wanted to travel with you. We were going to go to the Galtana's hometown after the war. Remember? Brother, say something. This bullet in my chest? Ugh. Well, Malak, you kind of had it coming to some extent. My G's so disinterested. I wonder what Alma's doing right now. Hmm. <laughs> That's just cold-hearted, man. What's this? It's shrill, that's what. Ah, it's responding to Rafa's spirit? It grieves Malak's death. Weegraf's despair and resentment summoned Valius. Then... You too grieved his death. Thank you. No, Rafa, it's... It's fine. Alright, so here comes battle number five. Rafa is about to transform into a Lukavi herself. Not really. <laughs> Could you imagine yet another battle? <sighs> no, we're, a we're actually done with Riavanis, finally. That was the last one. What? So soon? I know, right? Tragic, really. Ugh. I feel like I just got shot in the chest. Brother, Malak. Rafa, where am I? What happened? Ow! Brother, brother, I'm so glad. That hurts, Rafa. <laughs> so, I'm pretty sure that the game is going to attempt to explain this, but it's also going to do a really bad job. Uh, I guess we're going to see... But as I recall, this is about the point where the translation becomes really sketchy in a lot of ways. 
Let's see what Malak has to say. Somebody called me. I don't know. I've never heard the voice. Or that voice. So he's saying that the Holy Stone reached out to him. It spoke to him directly. Alright, so far so good. The voice said... Return to the ones with the right mind. Okay, so that's making a little bit less sense. <laughs> it probably should be something more similar to return to those in the right. Or like, return to those who are just. Uh, is it going to explain the other thing? The Zodiac Stone, here. Oh god, what happened to Islude? <laughs> My G. Yeah, here's the line. I didn't think the gods made the Holy Stones but more evil. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I say again. <clears throat> I didn't think the god made Holy Stones but more evil. Well, Lukavi made them to land in this world. Alright, so my G has clearly lost his goddamn mind after this string of fights, so allow me to explain. As best I can tell... What they're trying to say here with that jumbled mess of text is that the Holy Stones get their power from the will of the user and they are not inherently good nor evil. Because everybody who we've encountered so far with their hands on a Holy Stone has been kind of a doucher. There was Cardinal Dracula, right, who obviously wanted to use the stones in order to further his own ambitions. Similarly, Bormav, same thing. Weegraf, same thing. All of them wanted to use them for selfish reasons. It, it was that selfishness that actually called to the spirit of the Holy Stone. They had very powerful feelings, of course. They were very, very committed, very, very high in the willpower department, right? They very much wanted very badly whatever it was that they desired. In all three cases, power of some kind, right? So... They were sort of drawing on that aspect of the Holy Stones. But then we have Rafa, who is essentially the opposite. No less resolved than the previous three, but her intentions were much purer. So, when she was holding the Holy Stone, in that sort of moment of intense emotion, it too called forth one of the spirits within the stones. However, this was a malevolent spirit. As opposed to the Lukavi that were called forth by the by, by the three other men in their lust for power. Hers was just a desire to have her brother return to this world, basically. So in essence, the stones themselves are neither good nor evil. They're just powerful. And it, it's sort of up to the wielder to determine how they will be used. Which is almost kind of a subversion in a way. You'd almost expect it to just be a flat out evil stones kind of thing, you know what I mean? But it turns out that it's, there's there's just more to it. it it's on a person-to-person -person basis. Which, if anything, makes it all the more important that we're the ones who actually get our hands on these, right? Alma. Oh, I'm sure she'll be fine. What's the worst that could happen? Well, I'll tell you what the worst that could happen is. The worst that could happen is Act 4, because if you thought this game was hard up until this point, <laughs> Oh, god damn, are you wrong? <laughs> well, not really. I mean, it is hard up until this point, don't get me wrong. But we're about to be kicking it into maximum overdrive. Tired of the standstill, the Hokuten tried. I, I missed that. I missed that. And they are setting up Act 4 a little bit here. We are going to be talking more about the conflict between the Hokuten and the Nansen during Act 4. That plays a little bit more of a focus. Right now we were focusing more on the behind the scenes aspects of it. And I will say, well first of all we're taking both Rafa and Malak. We can talk about them more formally in the next one. But I, I will say that I do understand where people who say the story falls off in Act 4 are coming from. Because I feel like they do try to do a lot with this next act. Despite the fact that it is by far the longest one in the entire game. I almost want to say they would have done better to do Act 4 and then have an Act 5 for the finale. I think that would have been a little bit better in the long term, but I, I mean, I'm sitting here critiquing a game that is 22 years old. So, like, who, who am I to say, really? But the thing is, the first half of Act 4 is kind of spent on the Nanten versus the Hogaten, and then 
the final parts of Act 4 are attempting to resolve the Shrine Knights versus My G. Whereas I feel like fleshing out both of those storylines a little bit more could have helped in the long term. And perhaps people wouldn't have felt like Act 4 was so stilted in some ways. But we can see more of that when we get to it anyways. That is going to do it for me today. So, thank you for watching. I hope that you enjoyed. If you did, feel free to leave a like rating. Helps me out. Let me know your thoughts as well. And I will catch you guys on the next one when we begin our journey into the wonderful world of Act 4. And all the terrors that will no doubt come along with it. See you then. Peace.